and welcome to the program it's another Saturday edition of let's talk and as always uh, we are going to test you in terms of the type of thinking you're going to be doing right after the show we'll be talking about the benefits of Roy Boss tea and then a deputy minister of home affairs Fatima Chahan will be addressing the Women's Forum in Cape Town, rather the Housewives Forum, and she's going to be talking about family matters. And we'll still be focusing on family matters with Islamic Airline and Suraya Nawab. We know that our homes, our communities, our families and our loved ones all have not all, but a lot of us do have a lot of challenges in our families and in our lives. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to be talking about relationships, damaged and disturbed relationships. Is there a chance to save these relationships? Do you find a situation where you've come to the end of your tether and you think this is it, this is the end, this relationship's going to end in divorce? What is it that's going to possibly save that relationship right at the brink of a divorce make it whole and wholesome again well the expert is here she's Raya Nawab from Islamic Airline and we're going to talk disturbing relationships Salaamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Salaam Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh and thanks once again for having the Islamic Airline and me on Disturbing? I'm disturbed by the word disturbing relationships mm. because it says so much mm. about the state of our families and our communities. Mm. Last week, or last week, yes, we spoke uh, polygamous mm. relationships. Now we're talking disturbing relationships, and this cuts right across the board, does it not? Absolutely. Um, once again, at the outset, let me mention that this is just about throwing things out that I think are important enough for our communities and families to know, and it, it emanates directly from cases that we've seen over the years uh, at the Islamic Airline. And I, I say disturbing because they are disturbing to me. I, in, in preparing or in talking about what we're, going to, what, what, what we're going to chat about today, we spoke about various things. We spoke about, we mentioned the polygamy section that we, segment that we did last week. Um, and we spoke about the cyberspace relationships and how that can be damaging and the, those are disturbing things that are happening in marriages. Um, there's also things like pornography and the, and, the, and the actual detrimental effect it has on families and on marital relationships specifically. Um, there's also things like um, we know that there's an increasing number of members of our communities and our families um, and indeed within homes um, that are practicing different sexual orientations, let me put it lightly, um, but it's there, it's happening, we've had calls from, from You're talking from LGBT community. We're talking LB, LGBTI community. And it's happening in our community. We can't turn a blind eye. We cannot. We may not know all the answers for it, but definitely it's there in the community. And again, we see it at the office. Um, then the issue of gambling um, and how that is, that is uh, becoming such a detrimental part of, of the breakdown of, of marital relationships. And then also one very important and disturbing uh, uh, trend. trend for me is uh, because of the increasing divorce rate in our community, especially when it comes to young marriages being divorced, um, the responsibility that parents actually take on, on themselves to make sure that that, that marriage of their child, a son or a daughter, actually goes ahead. And in the process, they they sort of belittle themselves, they, they sell themselves short, because all they want to see is that 
the marriage of their son and daughter is successful. But in, uh, in the process, um, I think they, they just take on all the responsibility for the troubled marriage onto themselves. Let's start at that last uh, point first. You've You've, you've unpacked a whole host of issues that's playing out in mm. the community and in families. Let's start with troubled marriages, mm. very especially with young people. Mm. Uh, they tend to throw in the towel way too early. Mm. They don't seem to be in it for the long haul for mm. a whole host of various reasons. And the one very important factor is that it's no one person's fault. Mm. You as a husband can't be totally responsible for the marriage breaking down. It's not all your fault. Mm. Or the wife can't take well, total responsibility. Neither can you apportion blame to the two sets of parents. Mm. It can't be a very interfering mother-in-law or a very distant set of in-laws. Mm. Let's unpack that. Where and how do you get involved? Mm. And what are the boundaries? Because you often get mothers-in-law that take on this um, gladiator role mm -hmm. in the lives of their daughters or their sons, and they fight the children's battles mm. in this very unsettled, disturbing relationship. Mm. Where does one draw the line? There? Because okay. that's very painful. Let me, let me say, of course, it must be painful for any parent and any child in, in, in that extended relationship. Um, let me start off by saying that, first of all, in young marriages especially, the expectations that spouses have uh, for how their lives are going to be after their marriage are incredibly unreali unrealistic. And again, the media plays a huge part in that. You know, the, the soapies and movies and social media now, uh, what they see there is that virtual world and that's the expectation of their own marriage. And, and we know um, that once you get married, it's a whole different game. Reality you know, sets reality in. Reality sets in. And, and, and so I think young people need to be very aware of that. The other thing is, I also, we also find at the office that young people are ready to be married and to enter into a marital relationship, but they're not prepared to be adults in the community then after that. They are still young people and they still need to live lives like young people. But with Nikah comes a whole set of different responsibilities which they, because they become then adults in the community. Um, and so when they don't realize that and they're living a life completely different to, to, the, to the input they need to have within the extended family and the community, then somehow along the line, they just stay in that space, not really growing up and maturing in their lives together as a husband and wife. So that's the one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing for me is that there is an increasing trend, and this is very disturbing for me, for mother-in-laws to, to want to be the perfect mother-in-law. You know, so you'll find mom-in-laws that would go to gym with the daughter-in-law. <laughs> You'd find, I, I, look, uh, at a glance, th I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if you look at it deeper, you can see how the problems can, can, can come into play. Um, dressing like a daughter-in-law uh, or competing, you know, in a, in a, in a, not the agenda, the agenda not being that I need to look better than her, but I can also be young. I'm also young, okay? And then it's the society's um, expectation that you need to be the good mother-in-law, mm -hmm. you know? So you would, and, and today we know most young couples work, so they have dual income families. And so you would, despite the fact that you also work, eh, you would take on the responsibility of cooking the family meal for them and they just come and pick up their pots and go away and, and you know they do as they please they live their lives and you are really bending over backwards to try and make sure that they stay happy and they stay in that useful existence that they think their marriage is about and so for me this need for older women or, or, or women who are now becoming mother-in-laws to be like their daughter-in-laws or to be um, better than their daughter-in-laws or to be friends with their daughter-in-laws because let's face it you can have a perfectly healthy relationship with your daughter-in-law with respect and sensitivity and you can talk about anything and everything you may even go shopping together but there are boundaries she is not your friend you know and I think that is where a lot of uh, women in our communities and families overstep the mark.
There's also the issue around where children married, doesn't matter for how long, don't want to have a relationship with their in-laws for whatever reason. Mm. And we know there's no such a thing as perfect families. We know that every family has their own individual challenges. And of course, things go down, things go wrong, whether it's at the outset, before or post the marriage. People, we humans, we all make mistakes. So things are said, but then people tend to obviously twist things out of context and create a bigger problem, that's mm. number one, and then expecting not to have relationships with the in-laws. How healthy or unhealthy is that? How's that impacting on the marriage? Mm. You know, um, the movement to, to nuclear families has been an age-old um, phenomenon right through any sort of religious de denomination or any sort of uh, nation, okay, or any sort of um, country also, anybody, any communities, black, white, purple, whatever. Uh, everybody, modernization has in a way forced us to move into nuclear family relationships. But if you really look at it in, in, in our sort of communities, Muslim lifestyles, um, it really is not the ideal relationship to actually nurture because extended family relationships play such a big part in our celebrations of Ramadan and Eid and, and things like that, you know, in our just meeting and speaking to each other over a lunch. You know, it's not a big thing. It's not like you have to be invited for a lunch to your mom's place or in-law's place or something like that. It's just, it's an easy sort of relationship. The caring and rearing of, of young children, grandchildren. I mean, we take a, a huge responsibility in seeing to the well-being of our grandchildren. So extended family relationships are real, although young people need to, want to have this need to break away and we live on our own and we'll manage our we own independent. life. We're independent. we independent. Um, it doesn't really work. So I think the, the key to what, what, you, what you mentioned now, Julie, is that we need to understand the merits of the extended family relationship. But again, there are boundaries. It's not like way back when we all lived in a communal home with five bedrooms and all the children lived in together and it was just one big kitchen table. And it's not even like that. But there is a space for extended family. And the most important thing for me is that, especially again in the office, when they are, we also see a trend in very young people getting married. All right, hold that thought. Let's go for our first ad break. Saraya Nawabi is talking to us about disturbing relationships. She's from Islamic Care Line. Let's go for our first ad break. We'll be coming back and talking more about disturbing relationships and lots more. Do remember that still to come on the show. We're going to be talking about the benefits of rooibos tea, and then we'll also be crossing over to Cape Town and hear what the Deputy Manager, uh, Minister of Home Affairs has to say to the Housewives Forum in Cape Town. It's all to do with family matters, and that too is exactly what Soraya and I are talking about this morning. We're talking about disturbing relationships. Soraya, we stopped about uh, at the point where you were discussing young people. Yeah. People in the people, issues. Yeah. Um, young marriages today for me, we're also finding a trend where there are there are couples who are at a very young age are uh, deciding to get married. And in terms of extended family relationships, and we've seen it practically, that um, when a young a very young couple who are 18, 20, 21 years old and decide to get married, and we know uh, on the flip side of that is the Islamic said that if your child is ready to get married and say that they want to get married, then in order for them to live a healthy um, halal, halal life, life lifestyle relationship, relationship. Uh, allow them to be married. So that's the one thought that goes through a mind of the, the minds of the parents. But at the same time, you find this couple not mature enough to be um, a responsible spouse to each other, right? And in that case, we found over and over again 
when they live within the extended family system. So it's just the mother-in-law and father-in-law and this young couple who now come and live with parents. Because again, many times they're both studying still. Mm. Okay, so they don't even have the financial resources to run a home. Or possibly working but not earning, not uh, earning enough, enough money to sustain to, to their sustain lifestyles. A, a lifestyle on their own, mm. in their own home. So for various reasons they would stay there. And we find that those marriages actually adapt to marriage much quicker because a simple scenario, when you're alone and you're living in your, on your own in a little flat and whatever, when you have an argument, young people, when you have an argument, you are, are trying to, to find your space in this marriage and that it's very easy to get very angry, very uh, abusive, verbally abusive, screaming and shouting, throwing things at each other. This has happened, okay? Uh, but when you're in an extended family relationship, you're in the same home, you probably have your own unsuite or whatever, you would think twice to really lash out at your spouse, be it either way, the, the husband or the wife. Um, but you know that uh, there's another couple, uh, your, your in-laws are in the same home, so you would try and tolerate more, you would try and be more responsible in the way you react to an argument between you and your spouse. That's the one issue. The other issue is also there's so much of learning that happens. Absolutely. Uh, you know, your, your parents-in-law are perfect yeah. role, nobody's perfect, no. but they are role models yes. and you learn how to run a family yes. home, you learn adab, you learn so yeah. many things from them. Things. You learn adjustment to a new life, you learn adjusting to various other new people in your life as, an, as the extended family and uh, you actually have no financial responsibilities which, which really and financial responsibilities are a very important part of a nuclear family and here you will not have that so it gives you the space to actually um, enhance your relationship from the very beginning. Coming back to financial responsibility, obviously if you live on your own, you realize, and a lot of young people have a lot of fights because oh, of finances, yes. because there's just not enough money to go around for perhaps the extras, mm. or you perceive that the husband is wasting way too much money mm. on cigarettes or friends whatever. or whatever, and vice versa. So that's also a big issue. But let's look at the issue of whether you're in an extended family situation or a nuclear family situation. The role of both the husband and the wife and boundaries in terms of how much information about your your disturb, disturbing marital mm. problems go back to the parents or the parents-in-law mm. because there has to be a cut-off point yes. simply in the name of respect. I agree with you. Um, I think couples need to be very careful and this doesn't even matter for how many years they married. Okay, But I think there's a space for when a marriage is very abusive, physically abusive, uh, then I think it should it should be including the extended family, including the in-laws, both sets of in-laws, uh, to address it so that you don't perpetuate the sort of uh, behavior in the marriage. So I think there's there's an except a, a serious exception there. When there's open substance abuse, I think that's when you can call in family members and things like addictive behaviors like gambling and things like that, which are really serious social evils really. Um, so I think there, there's a space there for the, for the elders in the, in the family to come. And remember, um, our Muslim lifestyle is also about arbitration. So you, you bring in arbiters that would try and mediate issues. But I agree with you fully that the, the everyday run-of-the-mill sort of issues that you have if a husband is coming in late or a wife wants to go and work or arguments over rearing of the children or something like that. I, I don't think it's necessary for every little thing for to go back to, to the in-laws because it just it cre creates anxiety in both sets of in-laws um, and, and sometimes it, it doesn't really help the situation. So in that case, I would definitely suggest that they go outside of the family relationship. Um, Counselling is, is an excellent option um, and then where they can really talk these things through and when it's time or when something comes up that the in-laws do realise there's a problem, they can talk about it but then they'll talk about it in a very respectful way because they've been through the counselling and they've sort of sorted out their own issues and they can say yes we did have that problem but 
we are okay now and, and we can deal with it. Why I'm saying that the, that the major social evils that, that, that are becoming prevalent or are prevalent right now in our communities, in our families, um, sometimes things like that do need the extra support you have. And also we must remember that we, we are very good at just throwing everything under the carpet, you know. We, we, and that is why I thought as controversial as these topics may be, I think there needs to be a time where we need to put it on the table and say to our, our communities and families and couples that these are, these, this is the reality, you know, um, of how we, are, uh, how we are disintegrating. For me, uh, another urgency is that, I, you know, I, I, I just feel sad that the real moral fiber of our communities and our families especially is disintegrating. Absolutely. And I don't know if it's about this newfound freedom that we have, especially in our communities, taking into consideration the country that we live in, um, that there, there's just no responsibility with the freedom that we have. What I'm also finding, Suray, and I'm sure you've had a lot of these cases come to you at Islamic Care Line, and it's a very good thing that our girls are being educated and they're very financially independent. But it comes at a cost or it comes at a price because the <clears throat> moment they can't stand the pressure of a troubled mm. marriage, mm. they're ready to uh, walk out of the marriage because mm. the thinking is, I'm financially independent, I don't need to put up with your mm. demands or mm. your nonsense. Mm. And they just don't seem to be in it for the long haul. Mm. That's the one issue. And the second issue is supposedly parents that are way too involved mm. in their children's lives where they, they dictate to the children either the son or the daughter-in-law, what needs to be done. Tell mm. the daughter-in-law, walk away, you don't need that nonsense. Mm. You're financially independent, we are there, we will be your support mm. system. Mm. So please respond to those issues. Okay, I think in terms of the, the educating of our girls and, and making them self-sufficient, um, the first thought that comes to my mind is that our Prophet said, seek knowledge even if you have Absolutely. to go to China. I'm not disputing um, that at all. I'm yeah. talking about this newfound freedom. Yes. Um, for me, that is important, but also a very important um, way of thinking, and, and we find that in our religion as well, is that the more educated you are, the more humble you should become. Alhamdulillah, The more wealthy yes. you are, the more humble you should become. And we don't see that correlation happening. And that's exactly why we have relationships where um, the wife, for example, will say, I, I don't need to put up with this and, and quickly find a way out. By the way, it's also about, again, unrealistic expectations of the marriage. Okay, so premarital counseling is of absolute importance. And the Islamic Airline is running excellent premarital counseling assessments to deal exactly with what you are saying right now. Um, but we must also realize that being financially independent is not the be all and end all of a marital, of a healthy marital relationship. There are very many aspects to uh, dimensions in a healthy marital relationship. So yes, financial freedom and financial independence, um, independence is an important part, but it's not the only part. And that's where uh, women who, who are thinking this way fall short because companionship as you grow older companionship becomes extremely important okay you, you'll find women now who are divorced and or widowed and uh, they have everything they have everything they've got good businesses or they have good income they have a beautiful home they have children and grandchildren but they'll come and say we are extremely lonely and let's you know? stop there, because it, with that situation, it, it, it reminds me of last week's situation about polygamous yeah. marriages. But let's stop there for an ad break. We'll continue right after. Suraya Nawam from Islamic Care Lines here to talk about disturbing relationships in the community, in our families. And still to come, we'll be looking at the benefits of Roy Bosti. So stay with us. And welcome back. We have Suraya with us for a little while longer to talk disturbing relationships and family dynamics. You stopped okay. at the issue around companionship. companionship. Yeah. Um, so you'll find even in your earlier marital life, um, as well as I think more 
more prevalent in later marital life is this sense of com companionship and then parenting parenting your kids so if you decide to walk out of the of the relationship just because you feel you're financially independent and you've got a support system parents and brothers and sisters that's going Everybody to help you raise to, your children yes but you also need to realize that you lose out on that parenting that needs to be um, that your children actually that you owe your children actually as a couple so I think there's a, a lot of a much wider picture here for somebody to look at in terms of them just being financially independent and walking to wanting to walk out the one thing you mentioned earlier which I think is is of paramount importance is that um, the the interference so-called interference by by in-laws in telling couples, young couples, how to live, where to go, how to dress. Um, that is something that I think the, the, the in-laws or the, the specific spouse, husband or wife, who are, who is the mother-in-law or father-in-law, need to look within themselves and say, is this my need or their need? Is this a need for the young couple or is it my need that, that this new daughter-in-law fits into my family? You or see? also a situation where the son or the... <clears throat> the daughter, mm. um, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, however you look at it, takes back, back every little thing back to mm. her own family mm. and complains about everything that goes wrong mm. in the marriage. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking about the breakdown, mm. the respect and the trust between yeah. the two families concerned yeah. or the three families. We must know that um, when we marry, we, our community and our, our culture sort of doesn't allow us to just marry one person okay we, we marry, marry the family <laughs> we marry families and so it is a bit challenging for a young uh, newly married bride to to come into a, a, a huge extended family and wanting to know everybody and wanting having the need to be good to everybody because you just never know whose toes you're tramping on but it's also a skill to be able to get into the marriage and be yourself just be yourself, you know. Um, you don't have to act up to, to suit anybody's expectations. You have to act up and make to R that you are a responsible spouse to your husband first or the husband to the wife first. And when we have that and when we look at our nikah, the nikah ceremony itself as a form of ibadat, then we look at our lives completely differently. Because whatever you do in that marriage then, young or old, is actually uh, an act of worshipping Allah. So Raya, uh, when we look at marriage, and you've said it beautifully by saying it's not a, a union between the girl and the guy, mm -hmm. you're marrying the entire family, yeah. so both the parties have to embrace each other's families. Yes. We know there's no such a thing as the perfect family, we know we all come with our own issues yeah. and challenges, and it's how we navigate around them that make us stronger families, but also the issue where the first two years of your marriage, or even pre the marriage, mm. a lot of things go wrong. People put their foot in, mm. people say the wrong things, mm. maybe you're well-meaning, maybe it was deliberate, mm. but a lot of things happen and go wrong. Mm. Um, why is it, and what is your advice to young couples where they carry all the stuff with them mm. from 10 years mm. back mm. and keep bringing it into the marriage and saying, I want this to end because 10 years ago, your father said this to me, or 10 years ago, your mother said this to me, or just before we got married, this was done to me or this was said to mm. me. And hold on to all of that baggage and wanting to now end the marriage mm. based on matters that happened that many years ago there are two things here for me the one is the communication style between the couple themselves as well as communication between the the extended both the extended families and the other for me is is about this whole contract of nikah and what it's supposed to be because again in our premarital assessment what we do and what we stress on is that we must know as we're sitting here we come from and no matter how long we married for we come from a family of orientation where we were born into and obviously we had life experiences until we were 20 21 23 whatever time you got married 
And so that doesn't just rub out of your mind the minute you get married. You carry all those life experiences with you into the marriage. And once you get married, you form a union, which is the family of procreation, because that is where you have your own kids and you sort of, but both you and your spouse are bringing your life experience from your families of orientation into this marriage of, marriage of procreation. So we need to understand from the very beginning that people are different. You know, people have different life experiences and that would have, would have changed the way they've been socialized differently to you. You know, so we need to respect that. And for me, the two important things are respect and communication. If we can be sensitive enough to respect each other, whether differences they, and, 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 and agree to disagree on, on lots of matters and respect the differences that we may have and work, as you said, use a nice word, navigate around it, um, we'll be much happier. And our young people will be able to feel that they need to be independent, but they need to be responsible spouses. How do you tell them to, and I'm going to put this very crudely, mm. get over yourself, mm. move on. That I incident that you're referring to mm. happened five or ten mm. years ago. Mm. We've made our peace. We can't keep regurgitating all mm. that old stuff. Mm. It's not doing anybody any good. Yes. I, I think um, in a mediation process, it would be exactly just the way you're saying it, to say to, to a client or a, a spouse who's sitting in front of you that, do you really think that is important right now? Look at what is more important right now in your life in terms of enhancing your relationship with your spouse, your family, your children, and you need to put that to rest. Because if, it, if it's not done um, in a formal sort of way, in a session, for example, in a counseling session, um, uh, then that is going to play in your mind all the time. There's a process where you'll sit and you'll constructively communicate and address issues like this um, so that once and for all it's put to rest and then the couple moves on. Um, and as I say, there are various interventions that you can use during counseling to do that. But it's a very, but it's a very uh, prevalent um, happening uh, at the moment that people would go back. But then we must also think that going back to an incident that is irking you now um, is not the only problem you're having. There's a lot of other things that I play and you're using that as an excuse to bring out something on the table that is really here and now, that is really troubling you now, you know? Because if you, if you had that 10 years ago and you've lived 10 years of a married life and been happy, why would you bring that back to the table and, and sort of bring it out now in a, in a negative way because you may want out of the marriage or you may want to address something more importantly in the marriage and you don't know how to do it. So you, you, you're bringing in something or remembering something which was hurtful then um, and that you didn't work through. But again, I think communication um, is of utmost importance. The one thing before we end that I want to talk about is that um, questions about, and I mentioned it in the beginning of uh, the program, questions around intimacy, uh, the use of pornography, um, and this whole um, different sexual orientations of people are really causing untold harm to marriages. Um, I think our communities need to find a way in a very, uh, again, sensitive manner to be able to address these issues because they are important issues that can't just be wished away um, and they're really becoming detrimental to young marriages as well as older marriages because again there's social media comes into play and the freedom that we can do as we please how we please that's one that's the one thing for me that's important the other thing is that we know that there's a spiraling divorce rate in our community uh, and recently at the office we've had numerous calls about both girls and boys being divorced wanting to move on and obviously when they are meeting prospective spouses at this level the intention to meet one another is for to, to be married again and to to live another marital life go on to another marriage 
But the things that are happening and the things that are being promoted in these so-called meetings, sometimes they're introduced by family, sometimes social media, and that's an advantage maybe with social media <laughs> where you can meet somebody who you think would be appropriate as a spouse for you. And then also there are lots of Muslim marriage or marital marriage agencies, matchmaking sort of, which is very formalized and things like that. So they meet, but they, there comes a point when they have to meet face to face and talk with each other. And some of the very uh, disturbing things that have come on is that um, either one of the, of the prospective spouses would actually, actually order alcoholic drinks um, to, to be sitting and chatting over their futures, you know. And so that is disturbing for me and that, it, and that it's, such a, it's such a matter of fact um, that uh, so what, you know, and if one of them, one of the cases that came forward is that if one of them objects to it or is really disgusted at it, um, the other, uh, the, 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 the girl or boy who are now together meeting would actually be like laugh it off and say, are you serious? I mean, really, what year are you living in? So for me, that's what I'm saying. The is we've become fiber, way too permissive we've, we've, we've in become, every sense of the word. We've just lost it completely mm -hmm. when it comes to, and, and we're really using Islam um, to our advantage. When, it's, when, it's, when it suits us, we'll use Islam and, when, and a Muslim lifestyle. And when it doesn't, then it's okay. You know, it's okay to do something wrong. You know, so for me, those are very disturbing things to the fact, to the point that couples who have been, especially we find this very prevalent. We've got in, to wrap up, so a minute. Okay, we find this very prevalent <laughs> in people who are divorced um, in that you need to have a sexual relationship before you get married. And they justify it by saying, but we were married before, both of us were married before and those marriages didn't work. So we know what it's like. And that's where we leave me, it, Astaghfirullah. Yeah, and no so. doubt uh, in our future programs with Suraya, we will be talking about all of these very disturbing issues that's playing out in our community. Still to come, uh, the Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, Fatima Chohan, is addressing the Housewives Forum at Masjid al Quds in Cape Town. And it's also to do with family matters. And to wrap up, we'll be looking at the benefits. We need some relief. Leave. We need some sublimity in the program this morning. So we're going to be looking <laughs> at the benefits of Roy Bosti. Do stay with us. Sure, that was quite a heavy session with Suraya Nawab from um, Islamic Airline. But we're still talking family matters. We're still talking about the role of women in families. We're talking mothers, we're talking daughters, we're talking sisters, we're talking daughters-in-law. Let's hear what the lovely Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, Fatima Chahan, has to say at the Housewives Forum in uh, Cape Town at the Al-Quds Mosque in the Western Cape. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My dear sisters, beloved sisters and brothers in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I have been so excited for the past few weeks uh, ever since I learned that uh, a Majid who technically is my boss uh, has arranged for me to come and meet with you today and I was told uh, that you meet every Tuesday, Alhamdulillah, and that as a community of women uh, in this part of the Western Cape, uh, you do wonderful work and you do a lot of learning in these sessions. Uh, we were very, very pleased to walk around the masjid today and see uh, the library, which is a pride of place. Uh, learning is very, very central to our religion. The first word of the Qur'an that was revealed was read, which has connotations of learning. We also uh, went to the soup kitchen where we saw some ladies who were hard at work cooking and in the spirit of charity feeding so many, many people in need uh, around this province, alhamdulillah. 
Um, today I want to speak about a, uh, a topic that is quite near and dear to our hearts as women and as people who in Islam are the core of the family. Uh, mothers are the core of the family, wives are the core of the family, head of the household. We run our households and this is not in Islam an insignificant role. It is a very significant role because strong families engender strong communities and strong communities make a strong society and strong societies make a strong nation. And so the role of families, the role of the woman in the marriage is very, very important. But you know, <clears throat> everything that we construct, whether it's a social construct such as marriage, or whether it's just building a house, you need a firm foundation. And today I am not here to speak about um, the Islamic side of marriage. Uh, we've got uh, our learned Sheikh Abdul Rahman who can teach you more about these things. I want to talk about something that is very practical. We live in a society, we are a minority community in South Africa and for many, many generations before 1994, our marriages were not recognized, as we say colloquially. Yes? And part of the reason for that, before 1994, we uh, followed in this country something called the Roman-Dutch system of law. And in the Roman-Dutch system of law, um, essentially polygamy uh, is considered illegal. And because Muslim marriages are what we call potentially polygamous, they were not assigned legal recognition in the law. Of course, in 1994, we became a democracy. We, in 1996, adopted a new constitution which gives everybody rights. Um, you heard about my activist role as a human rights activist. And part of that, is the rights of women. Parts, parts of our Bill of Rights speak to the rights of different religions. We have a very um, forward-thinking uh, Bill of Rights in the sense that some of you may know, you may have family who have emigrated to other countries, but when you do that, uh, very often they require you to uh, become like them in many respects. So I always use the, um, the example of Germany because Germany's constitution is very similar to our own, but not exactly in some material respects. And if you were to emigrate to Germany, they will not allow you to get residency until you can show that you have adopted the German culture and that you know the German language. Now, in South Africa, we don't have that <clears throat> because we don't um, regard any one ethnic group or language group or racial group as superior to another. We have 11 official languages simply because we believe in the principle which, by the way, our Prophet wasallam espoused all of those years ago when he forged a community in Medina. So this notion that there is unity and diversity and we must celebrate our differences is very unique to South Africa. It's not found anywhere else. The other way in which South Africa is very unique is that we are a secular country, but we are not averse to religion. What we say is that there must be a place for every religion. So we in the Department of Home Affairs are responsible for the so-called recognition part, whereas the Department of Justice deals with the consequences part in the case of a death or a divorce, right? 
Um, and we just felt that this impasse was taking us nowhere. And we, in 2014, in fact, 2013, towards the end of 2013, we began discussing this impasse with particularly the MJC and a few other ulama bodies around the country, Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal in particular, because these are the provinces that have the largest Muslim communities. And we basically worked out that the current marriage laws don't exclude us from registering Islamic marriages. But there is a process through which that gets done. So any change of status during your lifetime has to be recorded on the National Population Register. <clears throat> Marriage is one of those changes that happen because your status changes from single to married. And this is where <clears throat> the difficulties come about. Partly, I think they're customary, because quite frankly, uh, my parents and her parents, my, my mother's parents before uh, her and my father's parents before him, were all married just in a masjid in front of an imam. They had a little paper which the masjid issued to them. Uh, that said that the nikah had been performed. But at no stage was there a recording on the National Population Register. Yeah? So what did we do in uh, 2013? Uh, we firstly discussed with the ulama the possibility of us uh, embarking on a partnership with the ulama bodies to ensure that we can forge a way to ensure that Muslim marriages are in fact recorded on the National Population Register. In other words, recognized in colloquial terms. And the way we did that was we ran courses for imams, over 200 uh, imams around the country attached to each one attached to a mosque. Sometimes a mosque has two, I believe this masjid has two imams who are marriage officers, registered and certified. And so one of the things we train our marriage officers who are imams to do is to screen for the status. And if they're not sure, they have to go to home, they have to send the person to home affairs. Home affairs then approves and then the letter is brought back to the imam and the imam is then told, okay, you can go ahead, or sorry, you can't go ahead, right? So these are some of the things that we train our imams to look for. Obviously, if you were to just perform a nikah ceremony, these things are not checked, which can later cause many, many problems. Then <clears throat> the actual solemnization process happens, which is the normal nikah uh, ritual that is performed and straight after the solemnization process we require that a register is filled out. Now this is the marriage register. Uh, in home affairs we call it the DHA 30 but for your, for your purposes it's the marriage register. It's not the one that is kept in a masjid. It's the one that is an official document that is issued by the Department of Home Affairs. This document gets filled out under the hand of the marriage officer, the Imam. It's filled out by the bride, the groom, the witnesses, and the Imam signs off. They hand over this one of the copies to the couple. The Imam then takes the other copy. There are three copies. The one stays in the register, the one is the imam's copy and the one is the couple's copy. The imam takes his copy and goes to home affairs and lodges this copy at our department. We then in turn will take that copy and affect the necessary changes on the national population register to record your, your marriage and your marital status. 
And that is really how we record marriages. It can't be right to say we want a nikah, but we don't want the obligations that go with the nikah. So that if indeed one day I divorce my wife, I want it to be quick and simple. I just say three talaks. And then if the house is registered on my name, it's mine. It can't be right. It can't be right that I don't have any obligations arising out of those marriages. Because your marriage is not recorded as the wife, the state doesn't know that you were married. So you will be forced to go to court. You'll be forced to hire a lawyer and the court processes are not cheap. And then you have to discuss in open court and prove certain things and allege certain things, which is very unseemly. As much as our courts are very, very liberal today, I don't think that anybody wants to go through that hardship of having to go to a court to prove after 20 or 25 years of marriage that you were married. It's an indignity. It's an indignity. And unfortunately, that indignity is visited on many of our sisters. So Alhamdulillah, I hope that you have understood uh, the process that we have forged, uh, Alhamdulillah, with partnerships from the different ulama groups, including the MJC. I am very, very pleased to say they have taken a very, very strong stance on this matter. But it's also up to each of us not to allow a situation where we go up to the imam and say, no, we don't want anything else, just the nikah. Because it's important to ensure that there is social justice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shed light in our hearts and in our minds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us and may we all be rightly guided. Amen. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu ala muslim alhamdulillah rabbil alam. Well, we women are truly the core of family and community. We play and take on very important roles as wives, as mothers, as sisters, as daughters and daughters-in-law. I certainly hope that Fatima Chohan, the Deputy, Manage, um, the Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, has given you food for thought. Let's stand up and let's take our rightful positions in family and community. Stay with with us. When we come back, we'll be talking to Adele Deploy. She represents the Rooibos Council of South Africa. And welcome back to our final segment of the show this morning. And now it's the time to be very sublime with a lovely cup of rooibos tea. We're going to be talking about the health benefits of rooibos tea. And in studio with us is the lovely Adele de Toy. She is here to represent the Rooibos Council of South Africa. Morning, welcome to the show. Good morning, thank you, Julie. You're a picture of glowing health. Thank you very much. You're probably going to tell me it's all the rooibos tea that you drink and all the rooibos products that you use. Indeed it is, I must confess. Yes, I drink a lot of rooibos tea and I also use products based on rooibos extract. Okay, great. We're going to talk about all that in a little while. Mm. Let's first understand who's Adele and why she involved with the Rooibos Council of South C Africa. Certainly. So I'm the marketing manager of a business that manages um, that's in direct selling and we also our, our product base is based on rooibos so I've been involved with rooibos tea for a long time about 15 years and in the the rooibos council I'm now the spokesperson which I've been for a year now and it's really lovely to be part of an industry and a, and a council that really looks after the interest of local our local euro rooibos tea. So we can safely say that Rooibos is proudly South African. It is unique to South Africa. Yes. 
and it is grown, it's cultivated somewhere in the Western Cape or Indeed. in the Cape region. Indeed. Tell us a little more about it and why is rooibos tea, we know that there are other herbal teas mm -hmm. being cultivated in South Africa and around the world. Mm -hmm. But rooibos specifically, why is it unique to our country and why should we be so proudly South African about it? It's a very good question because people, you know, they see rooibos tea and they know about it, but I'm not sure everybody knows that it's only indigenous in South Africa. It grows in a very small area, about a hundred kilometer radius around the town Clan William in the Western Cape. It's very unique because it's actually a legume. It's not known as a traditional tea. So you call it's a it, herb. It's a herb, right. correct. Um, so it's not like salon teas where they harvest the leaves. This is more like a leaf-like, needle-like structure that the plant has. It's very interesting because it grows in an area that's quite arid and dry and it enjoys those conditions. Um, the sand is very, very sandy. It's not very nutritious. Um, it's quite a dry area, so there's lots of long months where there's no rainfall. And rooibos tea thrives in that area. And what really makes it so unique is it has completely unique health benefits, specifically some of the antioxidants found in rooibos tea that can be found nowhere else in the world. And despite the fact that it's grown in such arid conditions mm -hmm. with minimal nutrition value, it is then harvested I should imagine yes and it is this amazing end product yes which billions of people all around the world enjoy yes. not only for uh, as a tea but for a whole host of health benefits Absolutely. let's talk about those health benefits because I understand it's amazing in uh, very especially for people who suffer from diabetes yes. let's understand that concept. Yeah, so there's about 480 million people around the world that have been diagnosed with diabetes, which is quite a crisis, health crisis, if you think about it. But the challenge with diabetes is that half of the people that have it don't know about it. So they're either pre-diabetic or they, don't, they haven't went to the, gone to the doctor and got diagnosis. So diabetes, the long-term effect of diabetes is quite vast. It can cause from heart disease, organ failure, and a really, uh, a, the, an internal problem in the body that cannot be repaired if you suffer from diabetes for mm -hmm, a long time. Mm -hmm. So rooibos tea has been found by the Stel Stellenbosch University to have an amazing effect on cortisol and that also helps to fight the, the diabetes effect and helps the blood to absorb glucose better which is one of the effects that diabetes has. So how much of rooibos tea does one have to consume to kind of keep diabetes at bay or let's assume you are a diabetic yes how much of this tea do you drink to still remain relatively healthy yes so i would imagine a, a six cups a day would be optimal um, for people that don't like drinking rooibos tea there's other ways that you can take in the wonderful health benefits in a capsule form for example and one of the benefits about other herbs with rooibos tea like cinnamon um, is great because you can mix cinnamon which we know is good for diabetes diabetes with your rooibos tea. It tastes delicious, nice herbal tea, and both of them will help manage and prevent diabetes. I'm not a tea drinker, I'm a coffeeholic. So yes. let's talk about how you prepare the perfect cup of rooibos tea. Yes. Can you take it with milk and sugar as yes. well? Yes. So rooibos tea is quite different from other herbal teas. You can drink it with milk if that is your taste. The best way to take it is to drink it as is, of course, with no milk and, and a little bit of sugar if you need to add it. But the taste, Or honey, perhaps. Or honey. Um, rooibos' taste is quite uniquely sweet. It's got like a caramelly, apricotty type taste if you buy high quality rooibos tea. So you don't need to add additional sweetness to your tea. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, um, the best is to let your tea draw as long as you can. So you pour your boiling water onto your tea. The best is make it in a tea pot because then the tea can stand and draw as long as it can. And then you get those rich polyphenols and antioxidants in the tea and you can get the most benefits from that tea. We've also been told that it's great if you're on diet as part of your diet yes. plan. Yes. But, um, and you've also said to us that it's grown in a very specific area in Clan William or just yes. outside of Clan William in the Western Cape. Correct. How is it then that you as representative of the Rooibos Tea Council mm -hmm. um, explain 
that you have so many different varieties of rooibos tea in the, you know, on the market with under so many different brand names. How will I know I'm buying the genuine stuff? Okay, so you can't sell rooibos tea if it isn't rooibos tea that's inside the tea bags in your packaging. So that's one thing. There's only one variety of rooibos tea, but it's made in two different ways. So the first one is fermented rooibos tea, and that's what we normally know a rooibos tea to be. So what they do is they harvest the leaves off the plant, they bruise the plant, so they, they make it fine, and they mix it with some water, and that's then left and fermented in the sun, because the plant is green and when it ferments it turns the red color that we know rooibos tea um, is. So that's the traditional way rooibos tea is enjoyed. But you can also get a green rooibos tea which is unfermented which contains much more antioxidants and health benefits than fermented tea. So what happens then after they harvest it they, they make the leaves fine and it's immediately dried so you can enjoy that tea without the fermentation process. But then there's lots of brand names as you, as you said and many Many people are experimenting and, and giving consumers wide varieties of teas, mixing flavors, adding herbs. So it's just a nice way to consume a beverage in different kind of ways. It's even included in some sports drinks or instant teas. So there's lots of ways to enjoy your rooibos tea. You also said that the best way to enjoy a cup of rooibos tea is to ensure that you have a high quality or a top quality yes. rooibos tea. Yes. How will I know that I'm buying a top quality brand? That's a very important question. So what you can do is you can open up your tea bag. If you see in the tea bag there's lots of needle-like leaves, dark leaves, that means it's a high quality tea. Sometimes lower quality teas contain more of the stick of the plant which also contains some of the health benefits but the leaves really contain the concentrated antioxidant and health benefits. Um, you can also see it in the color of the tea. So if you let the tea draw for a long time, the darker, richer and the sweeter taste the, the tea has, that's a, a, a good example of a high quality tea. Uh, rooibos tea is found in amazing amounts of cosmetic preparations, yes, perfumes, yes. and a whole host of other products. Is that the reason why you have the South African Rooibos Council? What is it that you're trying to perhaps protect mm -hmm. or promote by having formed this council? Sure. So the council is an independent body, and what the responsibility of the council is to really to look after the the concerns and the interest of the consumer of rooibos tea, that's one, but also we want to promote this amazing tea and gift that we have in our hands as South Africans, not only in South Africa, but worldwide. And then a third thing that we do, which we really think is important, is to communicate anything regarding rooibos tea, so promote its benefits, and we also invest about three million rands worth of um, money into research into rooibos tea, scientific research at our university. Talk to us about the health benefits of rooibos tea as far as your skin and bones are concerned. Yes, so rooibos tea contains many minerals including magnesium, calcium and zinc. Very good for bone formation and, and maintaining bone health and those same minerals are very good for your skin. So it's excellent if you have eczema. You can actually apply rooibos tea directly onto the skin if you have rashes, sunburn, um, acne. You can rinse your face with rooibos tea if you suffer from acne or there are many businesses who, who have rooibos tea extract in their formulations cosmetic and skincare formulations which then you can apply a cream to the skin um, for allergies eczema sunburn it's very good for babies if you have um, allergic babies rooibos tea is very good for your scalp so if you suffer from um, uh, what's that scalp condition that babies get? Cradle scalp cap. cap yeah. That's really, really Cradle good cap. for that. Um, and also, rooibos tea has amazing anti-aging benefits when you drink the tea as well as when you apply it to your skin. Because of those minerals, the antioxidants, it really fights free radicals and environmental damage that we suffer from the sun and the wind and being exposed to the elements. I've come across a couple of diets that suggest that you should, or there is, I think there's even a rooibos tea diet uh, what's that all about and is there a guarantee that you'd lose weight and enjoy optimal health while you're on the diet? Well, for the, for people who are interested in losing weight, there's two ways of incorporating rooibos tea into your weight loss 
process or program. The first one is some of the herbal teas available are really good because they pair herbs that are good for slimming with rooibos tea. So some of them are like fennel, ginger, um, senna. So rooibos tea is mixed with those herbs and that can help you along with your weight loss journey. You still need to be responsible. You can't just drink a couple of uh, cups of tea and think that you're going to lose weight in that. But on the other hand, if you're used to drinking quite a lot of sugary drinks, juices, cool drinks, you can replace those sugary drinks with your rooibos tea and that will cut down your consumption of those killer jewels. So really, it all adds up at the end. And we don't realize how sugary drinks really incorporate or make us gain weight and it's also bad for our health and our teeth. Let's go for our first ad break. We'll come back and talk some more about the health benefits of rooibos tea. Adele de Toy is my guest. She is from the South African Rooibos Council talking to us about the benefits of this amazing tea. If you haven't switched yet, now's the time to do so. Adele de Toy is our guest. We're talking rooibos tea. We're talking the health benefits of rooibos tea and much more. So do stay with us. Adele, we've spoken about diabetes. We've spoken about skin care. We've talked about um, other makeup Slimming. preparations. Yes. What about uh, cancer? Mm -hmm. If you're a cancer patient, mm -hmm. we're not suggesting that stop your meds or your chemotherapy, mm. etc. Mm. But how does rooibos tea, mm -hmm. how do you ingest it and how does that aid in your cure as far as cancer is concerned? So rooibos um, has been researched to be really beneficial for preventing cancer. There was a study done at the University of Stellenbosch on skin cancer and rooibos tea. So the skin was exposed to UV damage and after that rooibos tea was applied and the rooibos actually helped those pre-cancerous cells to self-destruct, to commit sure. suicide. So if you use a preparation on the skin um, with, which contains rooibos tea, you can prevent skin cancer. And of course, drinking your rooibos tea can also prevent cancer, which we know is right, quite rampant these days. And it's really a disease that we should be gravely concerned about as uh, as humans. It won't react with any of the meds that you're taking. No, so you can drink your rooibos tea throughout your, your cancer treatments if you do suffer from cancer, but prevention is obviously better than cure. I've heard of moms, young moms, who actually give their babies, rather than giving yes. them juices, mm. give them rooibos tea as yeah. a drink. Yes. Uh, but how else would you prescribe uh, rooibos tea in infant health? Yes, so there's many ways. The first one is, like you said, you can um, either prepare the baby's milk if they're on formula milk or if they're drinking rather going on to solids, drinking juices, etc. Not give them a concentrated juice because we know the sugar in there isn't so good. So you can mix the juice with the rooibos tea. They can get the ben anti-allergic benefits, the um, benefits from the minerals and the vitamins. So really, really good for, for infant health. But if your baby suffers from allergies, scalp conditions, nappy rash, either bathing the baby in rooibos tea or a applying a spray with rooibos tea onto the skin itself or a cream that contains rooibos, it's going to be amazing to, to bring those allergies and rashes um, to book and just to sort them out quickly. This sounds like the magic bullet, doesn't it? It does. There's so <laughs> many things I can go on and on. We can be here forever. And yet we're not. Um, are you kind of concerned that because this really is um, is amazing in terms mm. of health benefits and yet we South Africans are not uh, taking it up in as big Seriously. a way as you'd like, yes, you, yes. Uh, as you'd like uh, us to not because really. it's really, um, it's like it's I well. said, yes. it's, it's, it's absolutely wow. It is. Uh, very especially also with hypertension and, and, yes. and cardiovascular yes. diseases. Yes, so we know one of the major, major diseases out there is heart disease. So robust tea has been proven to fight cholesterol, it can lower bad 
bad cholesterol. It helps to fight blood pressure, which we know is associated with heart disease. But there was a study done with 40 people also at the uh, University of, Ste Te uh, of Stellenbosch, excuse me, by Janine Marnowick. And she did a study on people drinking six cups of rooibos tea a day for six weeks. And after that, it was proven that the antioxidant effect of rooibos tea helps to prevent heart disease, which is a major breakthrough because we know many people suffer from heart disease. And the secondary diseases that come from heart disease, like we spoke about with diabetes, is also detrimental to our health. So uh, something as simple and as affordable as six cups of rooibos tea a day can really benefit your health. But to answer your question about the, the South African's perception about rooibos tea, I think the council has done um, an amazing job over the past three or four years where we've seen an, a huge increase in the interest and the love for rooibos tea. Um, when, when I get into contact with people, they are just so warmly welcomed by um, the benefits of rooibos. They speak about it, they enjoy it. And if people go overseas or immigrate from South Africa, the first thing they want from home is some delicious rooibos tea. So I think here at home, we're really waking up to the amazing benefits. Of How widely tea. is it being distributed around the world? Yes. Question number one. And number two, is there competition to rooibos tea yes. from other parts of the world with their own indigenous magical formula like our yes. rooibos tea? Yes, so um, it, <laughs> it is exported to about 30 countries over the world. The biggest exporters are, uh, or the countries that we export to the most is Germany, wow. uh, the Netherlands. So those two amount to about 40% of the exports, big tea drinking nations. Do we know why? Yes, I think the Germans like their teas. The, the Netherlands, or the, the, the Dutch, um, excuse me, do also are big tea drinking nation. So um, the, what the German people do is they mix rooibos tea with a lot of other ingredients. So they don't necessarily drink it as a pure tea, where the Dutch drink it as a pure tea or with herbs. Um, Japan is also a big export. Again, traditional tea drinking nation. Yes. The UK also very big. The other countries are quite small, um, but those are the big three export exporting countries. So who's our direct competition around the world? So uh, that's a very interesting question, which I can I can try and answer for you. So um, your question was that is there competition worldwide? Yes, there are many indigenous herbal teas from all over the world. So and with many health benefits. I think rooibos tea is quite um, interesting to specifically people in Europe because it, it is seen as an exotic tea, which of course we're in Africa. For any, anybody in Europe seeing somebody from something come from Africa, they think is really interesting. Um, and then the complete uniqueness, uniqueness, the area where it grows, the health benefits, the taste. Um, it contains no caffeine, so traditional tea contains a lot of caffeine. So it's the fact that there's no caffeine in there makes it amazing for people who are either elder, elderly, infants, pregnant women. They can drink it where in a, in a traditional other tea, salon tea and other, other herbal teas, the caffeine will prevent those people from drinking the tea. What else can we apply or use rooibos in? We've talked about um, skin care products. Yeah. We've talked about um, infant care. We've talked about health care issues. Yes. Let's look at um, rooibos in perhaps our cooking and our baking. Yes. Is this being done? And give us some yes. tips. So rooibos tea is incredibly versatile because it can lend itself to savory or sweet dishes. So because of its high, high um, mineral content and good enzymes, it's great with meat dishes so anything that you want to marinate meat with or stews or curries it's excellent with those types of dishes so you just prepare an, a, a regular tea so to yes, speak yes. and use that as a marinade yes or, or you can add it to your liquid if you're making mm. a curry and you need a little bit of extra liquid or a stew or yes, whatever instead of adding water just make a cup of tea and pour it into your stew you would not believe the taste at the end especially if you cook it for two or three hours those that sweetness really goes into the meat dishes and gives it an exquisite taste but also if you like baking you can replace any of your water or your milk any liquids and um, with rooibos tea especially good if you're making desserts again it's spiciness lends itself very very nicely to rooibos tea so anything that includes cinnamon nutmeg those sorts of dishes it's, the opportunities are absolutely endless let's look at the issue around rooibos tea uh, can it be used to um, detoxify, number one? Yes. And how else do we use it as far as 
fighting off or preventing free radicals yes. both inside and outside of the body. Yes. So in our normal running of the body, there is free radicals that are released. So that's part of the normal process, especially with our breathing. Um, there is free radicals in the body that really wreak havoc on healthy cells. So what rheumatoid tea does, it, it helps to eliminate those free radicals from the body. And the effect of that is less disease, less aging. So it really is an, a, a, a health benefit that you can enjoy every single day. If you have health challenges, it can help you. But for preventative Okay, it really is a, a great and affordable option. In closing, what do you want to tell us about rooibos tea? I really love this tea. I think if you're not drinking it, you are completely missing out because there's so many things that rooibos tea can address. And one of the things that we didn't speak about is stress. Rooibos tea is a natural stress reliever. And if you're battling to sleep, it can also help you sleep better. So there's no other reason for you to exclude it from your diet. It can do so much for you and your whole family. And obviously it will help in um, getting you a good night's sleep yes. because it doesn't contain any caffeine. caffeine. So you, you, you're having a, a drink full of health benefits Correct. with not waking up in the middle of the night. Correct, and the high magnesium content in rooibos tea is really what is called nature's sleep aid. And that can, if you drink a cup of tea, rooibos tea before you go to bed, you'll have a wonderful night's rest. Okay, we're going to give it a try. And also, you have said to us that you can mix it with different flavors, Absolutely. cinnamon, etc. So give it that added boost. Yeah, and experiment it. and see what works for you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. see if we can um, start acquiring a taste for it. Thank go. you indeed for being with us and thank you for being so proudly South African. Thanks for your time. And that, there you have it in terms of the health benefits and all other benefits as far as rooibos tea is concerned. I do hope it's going to make you switch over from your regular teas and coffees and start experimenting and see that if this can work for you, it probably will. We saw Adele, she's a picture of perfect health, so we need to give it a try as well. That brings us to the end of the show. A big thank you to the production team and for everyone that joined us in making this show work today. Take care on the roads as always. Uh, it is Assalamu Alaikum and Khodafis from me, Julie Ali.